Okay. So now let's just start our class. I hope you are fine today. And everyone is ready for lecture two. Okay, so uh, this class was supposed to have it for two hours, but um, I think two hours is just too much for us to be interacting online. So what I will do, uh, I've split this class into two. So uh, depending whether we are going to have time or by the time we are done with this um, uh, part A of lecture two, if we have much time, then we can start looking at uh, another class, but if not, then uh, we'll, we'll meet next time. Okay, so uh, if you remember very well, yesterday we just had an introductory lecture to blood physiology. So we looked at uh, major components of blood and also the functions of those major components of blood. And then later on, we also looked at different types of uh, red blood cells, uh, I mean, uh, different types of blood cells. So we looked at red blood cells, white blood cells, how you can differentiate them in terms of structure. And also, we also looked at uh, the general functions of uh, blood. So I hope you remember that class. If you still don't remember it, it's, it's okay. Because there's a video that will help you remember everything. So if you go back to Moodle and uh, just download that video. You'll be able to listen to it at any time in case you forget. Okay, so even this class also I'll post it on Moodle. So if um, you won't be able to understand right now, there will be still time for you to go back and um, appreciate that. Okay, so today's uh, lecture, men will be looking at. Uh, hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. So hematopoiesis is a process by which uh, blood cells are formed. So these blood cells are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So the process in which they are formed is called uh, hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. So that's what we'll be discussing today. There are still some students who are joining. Okay, so basically what we're going to cover in this uh, part A, we're going to look at the introduction to hemopoiesis. Then later on, we'll look at uh, erythropoiesis. Then if we'll have time, we'll also uh, discuss leukopoiesis and thrombopoiesis. Okay, so this part A of lecture two, we are going to draw much on erythropoiesis because this is the process by which red blood cells, which are also called uh, erythrocytes, are produced or formed within the bone marrow. So you really need to know this process for you to appreciate red blood cells. So this diagram we discussed uh, yesterday is just um, uh, drug I'm showing uh, blood cells starting with uh, erythrocytes. We have white blood cells which are also called leukocytes. So these leukocytes, we say there are two major types. You have granulocytes and agranulocytes. Then on top of that, you have platelets. So the agranulocytes, we have three, the eosinophil, the basophils, and the neutrophils. Is that end with a few? are called granulocytes. Why? It's because inside the cytoplasm, you have these small granules here, as you can appreciate from this data. Then the granulocytes, you have two major types. You have the monocytes that later on will become uh, macrophages when they migrate to the tissues. Then we also have um, lymphocytes, and the lymphocytes are the ones that will differentiate into B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. So that we are also going to discuss later on. And this diagram, I hope you still remember. So it's just uh, showing you the major components of blood. So these major components of blood, uh, we have plasma. Then we also have formed elements. And today, this is a topic. We are discussing 
uh, the formed elements, how they are formed. So this portion where you have the formed elements, it's called hematopoiesis. So that process in which they are developed is called uh, hematopoiesis or hemapoiesis. I hope you guys are able to get me. Am I loud enough for everyone to get me? Yes. All right. Uh, so maybe we can turn down your volume music in the background. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is it better now? Uh, yes, it's All right, okay. Don't get it completely off. All right, guys, so let's proceed. Okay, so let's start with uh, hematopoiesis. Okay, there's still some people joining, so let me just uh, admit them. Okay, guys, let's get back to business now. So we're looking at hematopoiesis. Let's start with the introduction to hematopoiesis. So this introduction to hematopoiesis, basically you are talking of uh, the general terminologies that we'll be using. So first you need to understand what uh, hematopoiesis means. So this word hematopoiesis is a combination of two words. So you have the hemo and the poiesis. So the hem, hemo part or the hem uh, simply mean uh, blood cells. So the hem referring to blood cells and poiesis means developing. Okay, so developing or production. So you're talking of hemopoiesis, hem means meaning the red cells, poiesis meaning the development or production. So the combination of these two words, hemopoiesis, simply mean uh, the production or development of all blood cells. So these blood cells, you're talking of uh, erythrocytes, leukocytes, thrombocytes. So the erythrocytes, the process by which erythrocytes are formed, they are also called erythropoiesis, meaning that you're looking at development or production of erythrocytes. Then leukocytes, the, the process by which uh, leukocytes are formed is also called leukopoiesis. So this is a process by which uh, uh, white blood cells are formed and or produced. Then you also have uh, thrombocytes in that process that will result into production or development of uh, thrombocytes, which are also called platelets. It's called uh, thrombopoiesis. So today we'll do much on um, uh, erythropoiesis because we want to appreciate the uh, the production and the development of red blood cells in general. So there are a lot of factors that we are going to be discussing and there are also a lot of pathways that we will see to appreciate the process of um, production of these uh, red blood cells. Okay, so when you're talking of hemopoiesis, it begins in the 20th week of life in fetal, liver, and spleen. So within the fetus, you have organs that are developing there. So one of the organs that will develop uh, early enough in the fetus is the liver and the spleen. Why? It's because the liver and the spleen is the one that is responsible for the production of blood cells in a fetus. But remember, before that, before it became a fetus, um, it had to start as an embryo. So within the embryo, you also have other structures that are responsible for production 
of blood cells. So mainly you have the yolk sac. From the yolk sac, that's where you have the initial development of blood cells. Then later on, as it's being transformed into a fetus, then the other body organs will pick up the production of these uh, blood cells. So you're talking of the spleen and the liver. Then later on in life, after birth, you'll find that there are also other structures that will come in to help in the production of blood cells. So you also have um, uh, the skeleton that will come in and help in production of blood cells. So in adult or uh, young individuals, many have the skeleton that will take up the function of producing blood cells within the bone marrow. So remember, you have two types of bone marrow. So you have uh, red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. The red bone marrow is the one that will have those uh, stem cells, the hematopoietic stem cells that are responsible for the production of all blood cells. The yellow marrow is infiltrated with uh, fats or lipids. So you find that it's not active in terms of production of uh, blood cells. So how do you define hemopoiesis? So hemopoiesis, it is the process of development, differentiation, and maturation of blood cells from primitive stem cell. So you have a primitive stem cell that will now differentiate into different types of blood cells. So there are factors that are going to stimulate uh, the hematopoietic stem cell to now start to differentiate uh, into other lineage of cells that you now appreciate later on as blood cells, be it red blood cell, white blood cells, leukocytes, or platelets, they are all coming from the same cell. So they are a school of uh, thoughts that will uh, explain uh, how this thing started when you're talking about, when you're explaining the hematopoiesis. Uh, so we are going to discuss that as well. So there are different schools uh, of thought that will try to explain the different uh, uh, theories that, will, that came about for you to be able to appreciate the uh, hematopoiesis. Okay, so like I say, there are different uh, structures that are involved in hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis. So as you see in this diagram here, in a fetus, but before um, this fetus was formed, it started as an embryo. So within an embryo, there is a yolk sac, and this yolk sac is a structure that is involved in uh, hemopoiesis. So you can see, as the embryo is developing, even uh, its function in terms of production of these blood cells will start reducing. So you can see that here. Okay, so you can see that the yolk sac in terms of uh, function with regard to the production of blood cells, it will start uh, reducing as the embryo is developing. Then later on, it will become a fetus, and this yolk sac um, will completely stop producing uh, the blood cells. Then later on, within a fetus, you have these organs that are coming in, the liver and the spleen, that will take up the production of uh, blood cells. Then with time, you have the formation of the bones and these bones will pick up the formation of these blood cells until later on the baby is born then this is um, a child here who's uh, developing or growing so you can see that the almost the entire skeleton is involved in the production of uh, uh, these uh, blood cells uh, in children then later on there are certain bones that will stop producing uh, these blood cells. For instance, the long bones. So you have the appendicular skeleton that will stop producing uh, blood cells, especially uh, the distal part of these appendicular uh, bones, which are called long bones. So the, the humerus and the femoral bone, with time, it will stop producing much of blood cells. But remember that, the, the proximal part of these long bones, they will continue producing uh, blood cells even in a, an adult. So you can see here, this is an adult, but you can appreciate the proximal part of this uh, femoral bone that is still active with regard to hematopoiesis. 
And then the humerus is also active when you're looking at the proximal part of these humerus. So the other distal part, it will stop producing uh, uh, blood cells. It will be infiltrated with uh, yellow marrow, but uh, within the proximal part, that's where you can still appreciate uh, the red marrow. So it will still be active in terms of production of uh, red blood cells. So it's basically the same diagram here. So we proceed. Then this diagram here, you can still appreciate it's the same one, but I've added some more information. So you can see here down here that there is uh, time here. This time in fetus is measured in months. So you have months here, then you have years in adult. So in the fetus, like I said, you have the yolk sac that is responsible for production of red blood cells. So in an embryo, it's the most active uh, structure that is involved in production of uh, red cells or blood cells in general. Then later on, at about three months or two and a half months, this yolk sac will stop producing uh, the blood cells. Then at about one month, you can see that the liver is starting to, to produce these blood cells. Then later on at about two and a half months, you also have the spleen that is coming in to help in the production of uh, blood cells. But the spleen doesn't produce blood cells for a longer period of time, so it's just within the fetus that it will be producing that. You can see here, just, um, uh, just before uh, the seventh month, that's where it will stop producing blood cells within the fetus. But the liver will continue producing uh, blood cells until a baby is born. So after birth, that's when the liver will cease producing blood cells. Then the skeleton will pick up the function of production of these blood cells. So depending on the type of the bones, then you have variation in terms of uh, the quantity of producing these uh, blood cells. So you have more of uh, the flat bones that are involved in producing of uh, blood cells and long bones with time, they will stop producing blood cells just except for the proximal part of these long bones. Okay, so there are still people who wants to join, so let me just admit them. Okay, so uh, this diagram is just uh, illustrating the structures that are found within the embryo and also extra embryonic structures. So those that are found within the embryo that are involved in production of uh, blood cells, they are called intra-embryonic structures. Then you also have those that are outside the embryo, which are called extra-embryonic uh, organs. So you have intra-embryonic within the embryo. So you're talking of the bone, the yolk sac, the, the spleen and the liver that are found within the embryo. So these are called intra-embryonic structures that are involved in production of blood cells. And then outside the embryo, you have structures like uh, the yolk sac and the placenta. So the yolk sac initially is not within the embryo. So it's outside the embryo. So it's part of the extra embryonic structure that is involved in production of uh, blood cells. Then on top of that, you also have the placenta. The placenta can also, to some extent, uh, produce blood cells for the fetus as it's developing. Okay. So uh, this is just to expand on the same information. So by now, I think you, you understand the difference when you're talking of uh, the development of these blood cells when you compare an adult or a child to a fetus or an embryo. So in children, uh, in children you find that uh, all the skeleton is active in terms of production of uh, blood cells. 
So you are talking of the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton that is involved in production of these blood cells. So you have the axial skeleton that is involved in production of blood cells, which is active in children. So you're talking of uh, bones like the cranium, you're talking of uh, the ribs, the sternum, and the vertebral column, and also the pelvis. All these bones are involved in production of uh, blood cells in children. And also the appendicular skeleton is also active in producing uh, blood cells. So the appendicular uh, skeleton, you're talking of long bones. So you have uh, bones of upper and lower limbs that are involved in production of uh, blood cells. So here, the entire long bone is involved in production, but in adult, there's a difference here. So in adult, you have the active hematopoietic marrow that is found only in uh, axial skeleton. So the axial skeleton and um, the proximal part of uh, appendicular skeleton, which is active in chemopoiesis. So just not to say that uh, the femur and also the femoral bone, with time, the distal part of these bones, they will stop producing blood cells. So this question do come in MCQs. So I would ask you whether the distal part of uh, humerus or the distal part of femoral bone is involved in uh, production of blood cells in an adult. So you should be able to tell that it's only the proximal part and not the distal part. So always remember that that question normally comes in MCQs. Okay, so like I said, in the fetus, you have blood cells are also formed in the liver, in the spleen, but in adults, you also have extra medullary hematopoiesis that may occur in disease. So for instance, if you have disease that is affecting the bone marrow to the extent that the bone marrow is destroyed, or it's uh, fibrosed, you find that this bone marrow is not capable of producing the blood cells. So in this condition, you find that you're going to have extramedullary hematopoiesis, meaning that the liver and the spleen will still take up the production of the blood cells in an adult. So just not to say that these organs, in case of diseases of the bone marrow, these organs called the liver and the spleen, they can still take up the function of producing blood cells in adults. Under normal circumstances, when there is no disease, they cease to produce blood cells because now that function is taken up by the skeleton. But in case of diseases, you'll find that they can still produce. So you should, you should be able to take note of that as well. Okay, so this is basically the same information. So we proceed. So you can see in this diagram, we have. Uh, an example of a long bone. This long bone, uh, when, you, when you cut it, if you have a cross section of, uh, of a long bone, you can appreciate the yellow marrow here and the red marrow. The red marrow is mainly composed of spongy bone. So you can see uh, the spongy bone that contains the red marrow and it's active in, in terms of hematopoiesis or so it's the one that is involved in production of uh, red blood cells and other uh, blood cells. Yeah. So like I said, there are school of thoughts, different school of thoughts that we are trying to establish the theories behind hematopoiesis. So there are two school of thoughts that we are going to discuss here. So you have one which is called monophylactic theory. So you have monophylactic theory which is also called unitary theory. So this theory, there's a scientist who um, stated that there is a common parent cell of all formed elements of blood, meaning that he pointed out that there is only one single cell that will now differentiate into other blood cells. Okay, so this uh, theory was proposed by a scientist by the name of um, Alexander Maximo. So you have Alexander A. Maximo is the one who uh, suggested this theory that there is only one parent cell or one common parent cell that will now differentiate into other cells. 
Then another scientist came up with another theory, and this theory is called polyphylactic theory. So you have polyphylactic theory, which is also called trialistic theory, trialistic theory. And this scientist suggested that there's a different group of stem cells that would give rise to different blood cells. So here he was saying there are different types of stem cells that will give rise to different blood cells. So this was discovered by another scientist or was suggested by another scientist by the name of um, Askoff. So it's called L. Askoff. So um, <clears throat> when you compare the two theories, the one which is popular now is the monophylactic theory, which normally states that there is only one parent cell and that parent cell is capable of differentiating into uh, other cells. So you're talking about stem cells. So now let's discuss stem cells. So when you're talking of stem cells, uh, within the bone marrow, these stem cells are called hematopoietic stem cells. So you have different types of these hematopoietic stem cells. So you have the long-term hematopoietic stem cell and the short-term hematopoietic stem cell. The long-term hematopoietic stem cells are the ones that are going to develop into the short-term hematopoietic stem cell. And the short-term hematopoietic stem cell, later on, they will differentiate into committed cells. And these committed cells, they are committed to becoming a particular type of blood cell. So remember, you have the long-term hematopoietic stem cell that can differentiate into a short-term hematopoietic stem cell and the short-term hematopoietic stem cell they can be stimulated um, to differentiate into um, the uh, committed cells so these committed cells are the ones now that will become blood cells so we'll, we'll, we'll discuss the stages that are involved Okay, so we proceed. So these uh, stem cells, they have extensive proliferative capacity and also the ability to give rise to new stem cells, meaning that they are self-renewal. Okay? So they have the capability to form new stem cells. So they can regenerate to some extent by proliferating into other new stem cells because uh, you know cells are always dying so to maintain the numbers of the stem cells you find that other stem cells they are able to differentiate or to replicate themselves so that you have uh, a constant number of these stem cells within um, the, the bone marrow but you know with age the numbers of the stem cells will start decreasing even the capacity of producing blood cells with age it will start reducing then these stem cells, they also have the ability to differentiate into any blood cell line. So because they have the capability to differentiate into any blood cell line, this property is called pluripotence. pluripotence. So pluripotence, you are simply saying that these stem cells, they do have the capability to be transformed into any other type of blood cell. <clears throat> So like I said, you have these hematopoietic stem cell, the long-term hematopoietic stem cell that are found within the red bone marrow. They are capable of producing all types of blood cells, but they can differentiate into another type of cells which are called committed cells. So these committed stem cells, they are also called progenitor cells. So the progenitor cells are the ones that are committed to becoming a particular blood cell. It could be a red blood cell, it could be a white blood cell, or it could be platelets. So just not to say you have these committed cells. So the committed cells, they are not multipotent. They are more of unipotent because they are committed to becoming a particular type of cells. So this diagram is just trying to summarize um, hematopoiesis in general. So you have all the... Uh, blood cell types down here, the mature 
blood cells, be it red blood cells, basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, lymphocytes, and also platelets. But they are all, when you trace them back, when you trace back, you find that they are all coming from the same stem cell, which is called the hematopoietic stem cell. So you can see that here they are now being committed to becoming a particular type of cell. So these are committed cells or committed uh, stem cells that are coming from the same stem cell. So the stem cell can differentiate into uh, pro-erythroblasts. So these cells that are ending with a blast, like pro-erythroblast, myeloblast, lymphoblast, monoblast, megakaryoblast, these are committed cells. So they are coming from the stem cell. So there are different types of uh, stimulators or inducers. So we have growth inducers and differentiation inducers that are going to stimulate these cells to become a particular committed cell. So for instance, there are factors that will stimulate the stem cell to become pro-erythroblast. And this pro-erythroblast, it will undergo uh, some stages for it to become a red blood cell. So this is what we'll be discussing today. But remember that you also have other cells that are coming from myeloblast. The myeloblast will transform into progranulocytes. So these progranulocytes is the one now that will give rise to granulocytes. You're talking of uh, the basophils, eosinophil, neutrophil. Okay, so for it to become a basophil, the progranulocytes will differentiate into basophilic myelocytes, and this basophilic myelocyte will differentiate into basophilic band cell. So these band cells, uh, sometimes they are also referred to as stab cells. So band cells or stab cells, it means one and the same thing. So you have the basophilic uh, uh, bad cells or stab cells that can become a basophil. Eosinophilic bad cell will become eosinophil. Neutrophilic bad cell will also become neutrophil. Okay, so these three cells are called granulocytes. Why? It's because they contain granules inside. And then you also have uh, lymphoblast, lymphoblast will become lymphocytes. But remember, you have two major types of lymphocytes. You have the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes. And then you also have the monoblast that will become the monocyte. So uh, these two cells, they don't contain granules. So they are also called agranulocytes. So the granulocytes plus agranulocytes will give you the total white blood cells that are found within blood. Then you have the megakaryoblast. This uh, megakaryoblast, it's a cell later on that will differentiate into um, megakaryocyte. Then the megakaryocyte will start budding off, giving you your platelets. Remember, just like we had apoptosis, we had that formation of apoptic bodies that were budding off the cell as the cell is undergoing apoptosis. So this is more like similar. So you can see. Uh, these platelets that are budding off from uh, megakaryocytes forming the platelets. Okay, so I hope I'm not too fast. You guys, you are following me. Are you still following me? Or I'm just talking to myself. Yes, safe to say we're following you, sir. All right, okay, that's good. So we proceed. Okay, so this process by which uh, red blood cells are being formed is called erythropoiesis. And then the process by which the white blood cells are being formed here is called leukopoiesis. And then the process by which the platelets are being formed or the platelets are being formed is called uh, thrombopoiesis. So the two, uh, <clears throat> the two processes, leukopoiesis and thrombopoiesis, it will be another lecture. For today, we we'll dwell much on erythropoiesis. So we'll go in detail and appreciate erythropoiesis. So the previous uh, diagram in this one is almost identical. So here I'm just showing you the uncommitted stem cell that will give rise to committed cells. So you can see the hematopoietic stem cell on top here. 
that will now give like a rise to uh, pro erythroblast, monoblast, myoblast, lymphoblast, and also megakaryoblast, like I've already explained. So it's basically the same uh, diagram. Okay, so you really need to understand this diagram, not just to memorize, but you, you need to understand it and all the stages that are involved. For sometimes you can bring questions uh, in short essays, or it could be part of a long essay, whereby I can ask you to reproduce this diagram. So when you go back, you need to sit down and try to, uh, to draw this diagram. Just try to understand it and be able to remember the steps that are involved, like the general hematopoietic uh, diagram. And then later on, you also have individual diagrams for uh, erythropoiesis and then leukopoiesis and, um, and thrombopoiesis. So just remember that, that sometimes I can ask you such questions. So even as uh, you're appreciating this lecture, you should bear in mind that such questions can come. Okay, so I will proceed. <clears throat> So this diagram now, I'm introducing the factors, the stimulating factors that are involved in stimulating these cells. So like I said, these factors, they are called inducers. So they are going to induce a particular cell to differentiate or to develop. So you have two types of inducers. So these inducers, you have growth inducers and differentiation inducers. So the growth inducers are just going to stimulate a cell to grow, but a differentiation inducer is going to stimulate a cell to differentiate from one stage to another stage. So these inducers, you have different of them that will come here and uh, facilitate these cells to undergo development. Okay, so let's start now. Okay, so on top here, you have hematopoietic stem cell, which is also called hemocytoblast. Hemocytoblast, so the hemocytoblast is the one that has got the capability to be transformed into any type of cell. But remember, there are factors that are going to stimulate it to be, uh, to, for it to be transformed into a committed cell. So there are two major cells that will become other cells. So remember, the, uh, the hematopoietic stem cell, for instance, you have these uh, inducers like interleukin-1, interleukin-3, interleukin-6, then you have uh, granulocyte, macrophage, colon stimulating factor, then you also have stem cell factor. So these factors are going to stimulate the uh, hematopoietic stem cell to differentiate into common myeloid progenitor cell. So you have the common myeloid progenitor cell because of these uh, factors that are stimulating the stem cell to become the common myeloid progenitor cell. Then the common myeloid progenitor cell is capable of becoming a lineage of cells. So it can become uh, platelets, it can also become white blood cells, it can also uh, become monocytes. So monocytes, eosinophil, basophil, and also neutrophil are coming from the same common myeloid progenitor cell. On top of that, even red blood cells, they are also coming from the common myeloid progenitor cell, depending on these inducers that will stimulate it. So now, after it has become the common myeloid progenitor cell, there are also other factors that will come in to stimulate it either to differentiate into megakaryocytes or to become red blood cells or to become myeloblast. So for instance, if you have a, a stem cell factor, then you have thrombopoietin. So the TPO is called thrombopoietin. Then interleukin-6, the interleukin-6 is mainly produced by uh, the liver, the liver and sometimes by the kidney. So the interleukin-6 is going to stimulate this cell and also um, granulocyte macrophage uh, colon stimulating factor. So it will become megakaryocyte. And the megakaryocyte later on will start budding off, giving rise to platelets, which are called thrombocytes. But if you have factors like the same factor, like uh, stem, 
So you have the same, same factor. Okay, so here <clears throat> you have stem cell factor. Then if you have erythropoietin as a hormone, erythropoietin, interleukin-6, and also granulocyte, macrophage, colon stimulating factor, it means that this common myeloid progenitor cell will become red blood cells. But there are a series of um, differentiation that will take place here before it becomes the mature red blood cell that we are going to discuss later on. Here, I just want you to appreciate the factors. Then if you're just having the granulocyte, macrophage, colon stimulating factor, then the common myeloid progenitor cell will become the myeloblast. And this myeloblast is committed cell that is committed to be becoming uh, the granulocytes and agranulocytes. So you can see here that some of it now to become the basophils, neutrophils, and the eosinophil, and some of it can become uh, monocytes, depending on the factors. So these are the inducer factors, so you need to familiarize um, with them so that you're able to know whether they're going to stimulate these cells to become basophils or neutrophils or eosinophil in that combination of the factors. And then on the other side, you have the common uh, lymphoid progenitor cell. This common lymphoid progenitor cell, which can be stimulated by FLT3 ligand or tumor necrosis factor, or sometimes it can be stimulated by transforming growth factor. Okay, and then you also have interleukins here, interleukin 2, 7, and interleukin 1, 2, and you can also have the... Um, what is known as the stroma cell derived factor. So you have the stroma cell derived factor that can stimulate the common lymphoid progenitor cell to become the small lymphocytes. Remember when we are looking at lymphocytes, we had the small lymphocytes, which was smaller and also uh, a large lymphocyte. So these small lymphocytes, it will undergo development to become the large lymphocytes or the mature lymphocytes which are the B lymphocytes and the T lymphocytes, depending on the factors, the inducer factors. So if you have interleukin 1, 2, 4, 6, and 7, then it will become a T lymphocyte. But if you don't have much of these uh, interleukins, then it will become the B lymphocytes. And you know to say that the B lymphocytes are the ones that can be activated to become plasma cells, then they will start producing antibodies against uh, a viral infection, bacterial infection, or microbial infection in general. Okay, the monocytes, they are still coming from the myeloblasts. So you have these factors that will stimulate it to become the monocytes. The monocytes and the lymphocytes, these are called granulocytes because you can't appreciate uh, granules within their cytoplasm. Okay, so uh, this diagram is also almost the same as the previous one, but here I'm just uh, showing you the other system of naming these cells. So sometimes they can be called colon forming unit. So if this colon forming unit is within the spleen, so it will be called colon forming unit spleen. Then later on, they'll become colon forming unit blasts. So these blasts are committed cells. Then they will be transformed into colon forming unit erythro, uh, erythrocytes. It means that it will become uh, a red blood cell. So this is just like differentiation of cells from uh, hematopoietic stem cell all the way to the cells that we, we've been discussing. But remember here that the same hematopoietic stem cell can also give rise to other hematopoietic stem cells so that you maintain the numbers of hematopoietic stem cell within the bone marrow. <clears throat> so these stem cells, like I said, you have um, the major stem cell, that is the long-term hematopoietic stem cell, or it's also called the totipotential stem cell that can convert into any tissue type. So the totipotential stem cell, it can become any tissue type. Then you have pluripotent stem cell. The pluripotent stem cell, these are the ones now that will become uh, committed cells in hematopoietic 
uh, pathway that we just seen. Then later on, they can become committed cells. So these examples of these committed uh, stem cells, you have colon forming unit erythrocytes, uh, you can have colon forming unit granulocytes, colon forming unit uh, macrophage, just like that, depending on uh, how they're going to stimulate these committed cells to become other cells. If they are going to the pathway of uh, becoming red blood cells, then you are looking at colon forming unit erythrocytes. If you are talking of granulocytes, then you're talking of colon forming unit granulocytes. If the pathway is leading to uh, macrophages or monocytes, then you're looking at colon forming unit uh, macrophage or monocytes. Then you also have dendritic cells that we didn't discuss there. Dend uh, dendritic cells can, can come from the common um, myeloid progenitor cell, or it can also come from the common lymphoid progenitor cell. So it can come from both cells to become the dendritic cells. And these dendritic cells are the ones that are found uh, associated with the skin because they are involved in immunity of the skin. So the dendritic cells, they are similar in terms of function to that of macrophages, but mainly they are associated with skin. Okay? And other structures that are, uh, that are maybe in contact with the environment. These structures that are in contact with the environment, you'll find a lot of dendritic cells. So you can see in this diagram here, I'm also showing the, the dendritic cells. So you can see this dendritic cell that can come from both common myeloid progenitor cell or common lymphoid progenitor cell. So it will differentiate into pro uh, pro Dendri uh, prodendrite, and then this prodendrite can now uh, differentiate into dendritic cells. So these dendritic cells are also immune cells that will function uh, like the macrophages. Okay, so enough of these pathways because this diagram is basically the same, giving you the same structures. But I want us now to concentrate much on uh, erythropoiesis in general. So erythropoiesis. So unless uh, up to this time, if there are any questions, you are free to ask those questions so that we proceed. What we've discussed so far. Are there questions that you'd want to ask? Uh, I have a question, sir. Yes, please. This on, uh, on what's this uh, extracellular, Extra, extra medulla hemopoiesis, like I didn't understand there. So like if uh, the body, the, if uh, the bones do not produce enough, then uh, it switches to the liver and the spleen. Are there any conditions that are associated with that as in, with the person be normal if uh, the, the liver is the one that's making? Okay, so like I said, <clears throat> that uh, in an adult or in children in general, mainly you have the red bone marrow that is involved in production of blood cells. But there are certain conditions that can destroy the bone marrow. So those conditions that can destroy the bone marrow or if the bone marrow become fibrosed, it means that the red bone marrow is not capable of producing blood cells. But remember that these blood cells, they have a lifespan. So at, at some point, they will die. Okay? So you need a continuous source of blood cells. So if the red bone marrow is not capable of producing, what happens? So you'll find that these uh, organs, in particular, you're talking of the liver and the spleen. Okay? So the liver and the spleen they are capable of producing blood cells. But they will only stop after when, when the red bone marrow becomes active. So if the bone marrow is not active, you will find that the body will switch to those organs. So now the liver and the spleen will take up that function of producing blood cells to maintain the numbers of blood cells. So there are a lot of diseases that can affect the bone marrow. So for instance, in case of leukemia, okay, <clears throat> sometimes uh, as a result of uh, fractures that can also interfere with the, the function of the bone marrow, to some extent, you find that the liver 
and the, the spleen will take up the function in producing the, the red blood cells. But for these organs to take up that function, the disease has to be generalized in terms of affecting all bone marrow. If the all bone marrow is affected, then chances that the liver and the spleen will take up the function of producing red blood cell is high. That's the reason why in a fetus, you already know to say that the spleen and the liver is producing. So that function is always there, but it's just that in an adult and children, if the bone marrow is working very well, the function of the liver and the spleen with regard to the production of blood cell is negligible. But in case whereby the bone marrow is not able to do so, then the liver and the spleen will take up that function. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. Is there any other question? Excuse me, sir. Yes, please. I've got a, I've got a question. Go um, I'm asking. I'm asking if you can repeat the process of differentiation, um, starting from the hematopoietic stem cells. Is it the long term or the short term? cells that begin first before going to the committed cells. All right, okay. So to answer your question, <clears throat> let me go back to the diagram so that you can be able to see it. But um, in general, what I said is, you have hematopoietic stem cell that is found within the bone marrow. So this hematopoietic stem cell it has got the capability to differentiate into any cell type, any blood cell type. So that's a long-term hematopoietic stem cell. So the long-term hematopoietic stem cell is the first stem cell that is found within the red bone marrow. So to maintain their numbers, you'll find that some of them, they will now start proliferating into other long-term hematopoietic stem cell to maintain their numbers. So <clears throat> if you have inducers, these inducers now will stimulate this long-term hematopoietic stem cell to become the short-term hematopoietic stem cell. So now they are transforming from being the long-term to the short-term. The short-term will start developing receptors for these inducers. So when they start developing the receptors for the inducers, you find that the inducers or the factors will come and attach to those receptors, then now they'll be transformed into committed steps. So these committed stem cells now are the ones that are committed to be becoming a particular type of a cell. So the committed stem cells, they end with a blast. So you can have erythroblast, meaning that it's committed to be becoming a red blood cell or it could be a monoblast that is committed to becoming a monocyte, or it could be a lymphoblast that is committed to becoming a lymphocyte. Or sometimes uh, it can be transformed into granulocytes. So any cell that ends with a blast, just not to say it's a committed cell. So it's coming from the short-term hematopoietic stem cell. The short-term hematopoietic stem is also coming from the long-term hematopoietic stem cell. Thank you, sir. Okay. So this is what I was trying to explain to you. So you can see on top there, you have the long-term hematopoietic stem cell that can uh, proliferate and produce other long-term hematopoietic stem cell then sometimes they can differentiate into short-term hematopoietic stem cell. These short-term hematopoietic stem cell, they can become now multipotential progenitor cells. The multipotential progenitor cells are the ones now that will differentiate into uh, committed cells. But remember you have two progenitor cells that will now differentiate into these progenitor cells. So you have the common myroid progenitor cell, and then you also have the common lymphoid uh, progenitor cells. So the common myroid progenitor cells are the ones now that will uh, become the red blood cells, um, macrophages, and platelets. Then the common lymphoid progenitor cell is the one that will become um, lymphocytes in general. 
and some of it can be converted into dendritic cells. Just like a common myeloid progenitor cell can also be uh, converted into dendritic cells. So this is the sequence here. So you start with the long term, short term, then you have the multipotential progenitor cells that will become the common myeloid or the common lymphoid. And these now will differentiate into those committed cells. And the committed cells will become uh, the mature blood cells, depending on the factors that are stimulating them. Does that help? Yes, sir. I'm clear. Thank you. All right. Is there any other question before we start looking into uh, erythropoiesis in general? Okay, so we proceed. So this table down here is just uh, summarizing some of the factors that are involved in uh, chemopoiesis. Okay, so be it hematopoiesis, leukopoiesis, and also uh, thrombopoiesis. So these are just the general major factors. So you have the name here, and they are going to stimulate those uh, committed cells to be becoming uh, an adult cell later on. So for instance, when you're looking at erythropoietin, erythropoietin is a hormone that is going to stimulate uh, those committed cells to become red blood cells or erythrocytes. Then you also have colon stimulating factors. An example is granulocyte colon stimulating factor that is going to stimulate uh, that uh, uh, common myeloid progenitor cell to be becoming uh, granulocytes or monocytes. That's why it's called colon uh, um, uh, granulocytes colon stimulating factor. Then you also have interleukins. For instance, interleukin-3 that will stimulate a lot of cells to be becoming uh, different types of leukocytes or white blood cells. Then you also have thrombopoietin. The thrombopoietin is the one that is going to stimulate the megakaryocyte to becoming uh, platelets, so you can see here. Then you also have uh, stem cell factor. Stem cell factor is more general, so it will, uh, it will stimulate the differentiation of many blood cell types. Okay, so like I said, let's move on now to erythropoiesis in general. So at the end of this class, you should be able to remember this process of erythropoiesis. So let's start. So like I said, erythropoiesis is a process by which red blood cells are developed. So remember the red blood cells, they're also coming from hematopoietic stem cell. The long-term hematopoietic stem cell short stem hematopoietic stem cell, then you have common myeloid progenitor cell, then this common myeloid progenitor cell will start now becoming committed cells. So these committed cells, some of them are called burst forming units. So the burst forming unit erythrocyte is the one now that is basically committed to becoming a red blood cell. So this burst forming unit erythrocytes, it's unipotent progenitor cell. Unipotent meaning that uh, it doesn't differentiate into uh, multiple type of cells. It will only differentiate into a single type of cell. That's why it's called unipotent. So the potential that it has is only for a single cell. And that single cell is red blood cell. That's why they are called burst forming unit erythrocytes. So they are less sensitive to erythropoietin at this stage. Erythropoietin doesn't have an effect on this cell. Why? It's because this cell doesn't have receptors on its plasma membrane for erythropoietin hormone. So even if you have erythropoietin hormone in circulation, it won't stimulate this cell to differentiate into other cell types. So you know to say that, but there will be also other inducer factors that can actually stimulate this cell to become the erythrocytes. Later on, it will become sensitive to erythrocytes at different stages. So it will give rise to a thousand of nucleated erythroid precursor cells. So these erythroid precursor cells, they are capable of undergoing mitosis. So in vitro or outside the living organism, you can also stimulate this cell to undergo mitosis. So you have a lot of these uh, burst forming 
uh, unit erythrocytes that can differentiate into red blood cells. So outside the living organism, you can still stimulate them. And then these can also be used in transplants. So you can have stem cell transplant or red bone marrow transplant, whereby these cells are stimulated first so that they are capable of producing more blood cells so that when they are transplanted into a patient, for instance, a leukemia patient, then they will be able to be transformed into blood cells later on. So they can undergo some changes to become colon forming units. So once they're becoming colon forming units, it means that these committed steps now, they have gone into a cascade of differentiation that will become the red blood cell. So you have the colon forming units erythrocytes, and these colon forming units erythrocytes will develop the receptors for erythropoietin. So once you have these colon forming units erythrocytes, with a lot of receptors for erythropoietin. Once erythropoietin is being produced now by the kidneys and the liver, it will go and bind to the receptors of these particular cells, and then now they can differentiate into red blood cells. Okay, so on top here, you have the process of erythropoiesis. So you can see you have the stem cell, which is also called the hemo cytoblast, the hemocytoblast can be stimulated by those inducer factors to become a committed cell. This committed cell is called pro-erythroblast. So it's committed to be becoming red blood cells, finally. So now <clears throat> these committed cells will start differentiating into other cells. So the development pathway of erythropoiesis, you have uh, stages or phases. You have phase one, phase two, and phase three. In phase one, this is where the pro erythroblast is going to differentiate into early erythroblast. So in early erythroblast, this is where you have ribosome synthesis or development of ribosomes. Remember that you want to produce a lot of hemoglobin and hemoglobin is a protein. So you need a lot of these ribosomes that will help in the synthesis of a protein, which is called hemoglobin. And you know to say ribosomes, they have the machinery for the synthesis of protein. You remember in first semester, the ribosomes are composed of 40S, KCS, and the transfer RNA at the center. That is capable of translating the message that is coming from messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA is coming from transcription of DNA. So the information is coming from the DNA, uh, messenger RNA, then from messenger RNA, then they will be translated by the ribosomes into a protein that will become a hemoglobin. So in phase one, this is where you have more production or synthesis of uh, ribosomes. Then after phase one, it will enter phase two. In phase two, you have hemoglobin accumulation because the ribosomes are now there. So they are now producing or synthesizing a lot of hemoglobin. So in phase two, uh, phase two you find that the early erythroblasts will differentiate into the late erythroblast. Then you can see the presence of uh, the color here, the change in color. This is where now you have accumulation of hemoglobin. So if you have this nucleus, then it means that there is no uh, enough room for you to accommodate more of this um, uh, hemoglobin. So now from phase two, it will enter phase three whereby the nucleus has to be uh, removed from the cells. So you have extrusion of the nucleus to create more room for hemoglobin. So you can see here that there is accumulation of this hemoglobin and then later on there's ejection of the nucleus in phase three. So in phase three of um, erythropoiesis, you find that there is ejection of the nucleus, and then the normal blast will be transformed into reticulocyte. So the reticulocyte doesn't have a nucleus as well, but this reticulocyte is an immature red blood cell. So it has to mature to become the mature red blood cell. So you can see it will have to undergo a differentiation in terms of change in shape and structure for it to become a mature erythrocyte. So the reticulocytes, you can see in the cytoplasm of the reticulocytes, you can appreciate a network of this chromatin structure. This chromatin structure is simply ribosomal RNA. 
this is where the name reticulocyte comes from. So you have a network or a reticulum of ribosomal RNA, hence the name reticulocyte. So after it differentiates, it will become now erythrocytes. So you find that the development, there are also other factors that are going to stimulate the reticulocyte to become erythrocytes. Okay. Then this will be released now in peripheral blood for transportation of oxygen and other substances like carbon dioxide. So it's basically the same process here, but now of attached time or duration for each stage. So you can see uh, this cell as pro-erythroblast, it will take about 20 hours for it to differentiate into another type of a cell. So you can see here that it has differentiated into another type of the cell from the pro-erythroblast into uh, basophilic erythroblast. Then at this stage, it will also spend about 20 hours as basophilic erythroblast. So it's called basophilic, why? It's because in the cytoplasm here, you have more of a blue color. That's why it's called basophilic erythroblast. And then as you start producing a hemoglobin and then to become polychromatophilic erythroblast. So you have polychromatophilic erythroblast because you have accumulation of hemoglobin. So at this stage, it will also take about 25 hours for it to differentiate into orthochromatophilic erythroblasts, then later on to become um, <clears throat> a reticulocyte. For it to become a reticulocyte, you need to eject the nucleus. So you can appreciate here the Pinotic nucleus. A pinotic nucleus is simply mean a condensed nucleus. So this condensed nucleus will be uh, removed from uh, reticulocytes, and then you have these reticulocytes that can take three days for it to be introduced into circulation. So it will take about one to three days then to become a mature red blood cell. So this entire process can take about three to five days. So the process of red blood cell production it can take approximately about seven days from the pro-erythroblast to be becoming erythrocytes. So it will take about seven days. So you need to know that as well, because at each stage, it will spend some time. <clears throat> this diagram is also looking at erythroblast or erythropoiesis, and this erythropoiesis here have attached the size of the cells. As they are developing, you can see there's a decrease in the size of cells from the pro erythroblast all the way to the mature uh, red blood cell. It will actually take about approximately uh, five to seven days. So you can see this transformation uh, of the cells, the change in shape of the cells. So starting with the pro erythroblast in terms of uh, the diameter of the cells, they are between 15 to 20 micrometers in their basophilic cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm, it appears blue. Why is it? Because they have affinity for the basic part of the stain. So it's called basophilic uh, cytoplasm and with a, nuclear, uh, with a nucleolus. So you have the nucleolus because a lot of them, they are called nucleoli at the center of the nucleus here. Then after that, after day one, in day two, they will become um, Erythroblast, these erythroblasts now, they, they also have a basophilic uh, cytoplasm. You can see it's blue here, but in terms of size, it's between 14 to 17 micrometers in diameter. So these cells are mitotic cells, so they are able to proliferate into other erythroblasts so that you have so many red blood cells developing from one pro-erythroblast. So one pro-erythroblast, it will differentiate into erythroblast and this erythroblast will undergo mitosis so that you have uh, a colony of cells that are developing okay and then after mitosis they will continue with the developing uh, development and then they'll become polychromat uh, polychromatophilic erythroblast in terms of uh, size it's between 10 to 15 micrometers in diameter and then sometimes you have a condition which is called uh, polychromasia this polychromasia is a condition where you have a lot of polychromatophilic erythroblasts being released to the circulation. So you have these immature red blood cells that will appear in circulation. Because there are a lot of them, then you have a condition which is called polychromasia. So 
polychromasia simply mean that you have a lot of these cells in circulation. So they haven't complete their development. So they are not effective in terms of transportation of oxygen. You find that the patient will be so weak, the muscles are not receiving enough oxygen. You know, if you don't have enough oxygen, you're not producing enough ATP, and then there is no energy for muscle activity. So there's weakness, okay? Then at day, day four, you have the normal blasts. These normal blasts, they're the ones now that you have a condensed nucleus, which is called the pinotic nucleus. The pinotic nucleus is the condensed nucleus because it's about to be ejected from the cell. So it will condense. Then you have uh, hemoglobin is maximum here. And then on day five, day seven, this is where you have reticulocytes. After you have ejected the nucleus, then it will become reticulocyte. And these reticulocytes later on, they will mature into, uh, they will differentiate into the mature red blood cells. And then the red blood cell will go to the bloodstream. So the normal size of a red blood cell is between seven 0.4. It's 7.4 micrometer in diameter. This is the mature red blood cell, but the uh, reticulocytes is about 7.3. So meaning that they are almost uh, the same in terms of size, but the reticulocyte is bigger than the mature red blood cell. So sometimes you can have a lot of these reticulocytes in circulation, but just not to say that sometimes the reticulocytes they can be released to the circulation, and then after one day they will mature into the red blood cell, which is normal. Okay, so this diagram is just the same, just showing the same uh, diagrams of these cells undergoing development that we've already discussed. And this is a pathway for erythropoiesis. It's basically the same, but here I've attached the factors that are involved. So you have the colon forming unit, uh, granulocytes, erythrocytes, uh, macrophages, and also uh, megakaryocytes. So this will now differentiate into burst forming unit, erythro sites and the burst forming units they are factors that will stimulate it to differentiate into burst forming unit erythrocytes late then from here you also have other factors that will stimulate it to become uh, the colon forming unit erythrocyte then okay i can see there's a hand there um yes sir um ah, i think the data is like people are really tired Unless I don't know if I'm talking for myself, but let me take a break, even like a five minute break. All right, I think there's no problem with that because I, I, the, the main point is I don't want to be talking to myself. So um, there are just a few slides remaining. So maybe we can take um, a 10 minutes break. Then when we come back, we just wind up. How is that? Thank you. Yeah, that sounds fine. All right, okay, so let's just take a 10 minutes break. Then when we come back, we'll just wind up. Then we come back. Hello? Guys, I hope you are getting me. Let's get back to business. The break is over now. So let's just wind up. I can see there is a hand. You can go ahead and ask what you want to ask. Uh, good morning, sir. I wanted to ask you, could you please explain uh, this diagram again? Which one? Uh, this same uh, diagram we're on. All right. Could you please start where... it from the beginning? Yeah, that's where we're going to start from. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I'll, I'll take it that everyone is back now. So uh, this diagram that you are seeing right now is specific for erythropoiesis. Remember, we have the hematopoietic stem cell the long-term hematopoietic stem cell that can differentiate into the short-term hematopoietic stem cell. And the short-term hematopoietic stem cell can differentiate into 
either common myeloid progenitor cell or common lymphoid progenitor cell. So for the red blood cell development, mainly it's coming from the common myeloid progenitor cell. So now that common myeloid progenitor cell, it will transform into a colon forming unit. So you have the colon forming unit. This is where this diagram is coming from. So depending on uh, the kind of cells that cell will become later on, you have different types of colon forming unit cells. So these colon forming units are committed cells. So if it's committed to be becoming granulocytes, erythrocytes, monocytes, or macrophages, then or megakaryocytes, then you have this cell, which is showing here, the colon forming unit, granulocytes, erythrocytes, macrophages or monocytes, and megakaryocytes that will become platelets. So there are factors that will stimulate this cell to differentiate into another cell. So you have these three factors. You have the interleukin-3, then you have granulocyte macrophage uh, colon stimulating factor, then you have granulocyte colon stimulating factor. So these factors will go and bind to the receptors of colon forming unit gym. Then this colon forming unit gym will be uh, differentiated into burst forming unit. So you can see now you are on this stage, the burst forming unit. So the, the, the burst forming unit that will become erythrocytes is called the burst forming unit erythrocytes. Remember, at this stage, it's still not sensitive to erythropoietin, but it's still sensitive to other inducers. So here you have these factors that are going to stimulate this cell to differentiate into another cell into, or to go into another stage. So you have these units that you can, uh, the inducers that you can see here, interleukin-3 and also GMCSF, then you also have interleukin-9 and IGF-1. So they're going to stimulate the burst-forming unit erythrocytes into the burst-forming unit erythrocytes LET, which is also called the pro-erythroblast. So the pro-erythroblast is committed to be becoming the red blood cell. So there are also other uh, factors that were stimulated. So you can see the factors listed here the interleukin-3, the granulocyte uh, macrophage colon stimulating factor, interleukin-9, and also erythropoiesis, uh, erythropoietin. So this is where erythropoietin hormone comes in to stimulate this cell to become another cell. And then once it has been stimulated, then it will be transformed now from burst forming unit into colon forming unit erythrocytes. So you can have now colon forming unit erythrocytes. Then with the presence of uh, erythropoietin, then it will be converted into pro-erythroblast. The pro-erythroblast will be converted into basophilic erythroblast. It's called basophilic because in the cytoplasm here, it will stain blue. So because of that blue staining of the cytoplasm, it's called basophilic erythroblast then later on you start producing uh, hemoglobin because now you have lots of uh, ribosomes that are involved in production of hemoglobin. Then once you start producing hemoglobin, the color will start changing from basophilic to becoming more of eosinophilic. So this eosinophilic now as a result of hemoglobin, this, uh, the cell will change from basophilic erythroblast into polychromatic erythroblast. So this polychromatic is because the hemoglobin that is accumulating here. So from here now, you also have other factors that are going to stimulate it to transform into orthochromatic erythroblast. The orthochromatic erythroblast has got a full concentration of hemoglobin, but you still have a pycnotic nucleus or condensed nucleus. So this pycnotic nucleus has to be extruded from the cell. So you have now ejection of uh, the uh, nucleus, and then once you remove the nucleus, you have the reticulocytes. 
the reticulocytes will still have a network of ribosomal RNA. You can see in the cytoplasm there. Then they will be changed in terms of shape from a reticulocyte into a red blood cell, which is called uh, erythrocytes in circulation. So these reticulocytes, they are also able to join the bloodstream. So they can move in between the endothelial cells into the, uh, the cardiovascular system or into the blood vessels. Then sometimes this reticulocyte can be transformed into red blood cell at this level within the bone marrow. Then later on, the red blood cell can move in between the endothelial cell to move into the bloodstream. Then you have now these erythrocytes in circulation. Remember, there is change in terms of the size and also the shape of the cell as these cells are developing. Later on, you have the reticulocyte, which is about uh, 7.3 micrometer in diameter, and then once it becomes a mature red blood cell or erythrocytes is about 7.2 uh, micrometer in diameter. So now you have the normal shape of red blood cell, which is uh, loaded with a lot of hemoglobin for the transportation of oxygen. Then you start functioning as such within blood for the transportation of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay, so this slide is just uh, highlighting some changes that takes place during erythropoiesis. So these changes that are taking place during erythropoiesis, the major ones, we have the decrease in size. So we saw that the uh, committed cell, the erythroblast or pro-erythroblast, they are so big, but with time they will start becoming smaller. So there is change in terms of size. The change is a decrease in size until finally you have a smaller cell, which is a red blood cell. So you have the decrease in size. Then there is also loss of mitotic activity. Remember, the, uh, the blast forming units, they are mitotic, so they are able to proliferate into other cells. But later on, it will start losing that ability to, uh, to, to undergo mitosis in short term. Then, there is also hemoglobinization, meaning that there is production of this hemoglobin by the help of the ribosomes. And then there's also change in uh, cell shape. So the, 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 the shape of the cell will start changing from globular to more biconcave. So it will change from globular, which is round, or more like a global, then to become more of biconcave as a, a mature red blood cell. Then there is disappearance of the nucleus, you know, to say that. There is also disappearance of mitochondria and ribosomes. Okay, so there's disappearance of the nucleus, uh, the mitochondria and RNA. You're talking of ribosome RNA and also the RNA of this particular cell. So you don't want mitochondria, I already explained, because you don't want the red blood cell to be using a lot of uh, oxygen. Then you also don't want the nucleus because you want to load this cell with a lot of hemoglobin. Then you also don't want a lot of RNA because RNA, uh, mainly is involved in the translation. So once you have enough hemoglobin, then you are going to get rid of the RNA so that this cell is basically there for the purpose of transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide later on. Then there's also change in staining. So the staining changes from basophilic to eosinophilic, from blue cytoplasm to a cytoplasm that looks reddish. So from blue to, late, uh, to red. So there's that transformation in terms of uh, change in staining. So these are the major changes that take place during uh, erythropoiesis. Then factors that are involved in regulation of erythropoiesis. So we have those uh, inducer factors and other factors that we'll be discussing now. So you have the general factors that are involved in regulation of erythropoiesis. The major factor is hypoxia. So hypoxia is different from hypoxemia. So remember, hypoxemia is low blood levels in the uh, low oxygen levels in the blood. So if you have low oxygen levels in the blood, that is called hypoxemia. But if you have insufficient oxygen to sustain the function of the human body or the body of a living organism, then that is called hypoxia. 
So when you don't have sufficient oxygen to carry out these metabolic processes in the body, then it means you have hypoxia. It means that hypoxemia can develop into hypoxia with time. So once you have hypoxia, then there's an increase in production of erythropoietin. This erythropoietin is produced by um, uh, the kidneys and uh, the liver cells. So the kidneys, they are producing the majority of erythropoietin. About 85% of erythropoietin is being produced by the kidneys uh, from the kidney nephron. Remember from the kidney nephron, you have the peritubular capillaries that will contain uh, pericytes, and these pericytes are the ones that are responsible for the production of erythropoietin. So with hypoxia, it's going to stimulate those cells to produce more of uh, erythropoietin. And this erythropoietin will stimulate more production of red blood cells. So it makes sense when you have hypoxia, you need to increase uh, the number of red blood cells so that you increase the chances of interaction between oxygen and red blood cells so that you carry much oxygen to the tissues. Then you also have growth inducers. Then you have vitamins that are involved in stimulating the production uh, of red blood cells. So you're talking of regulation of erythropoiesis. In terms of maturation factors, so factors that are stimulating maturation of red blood cells, you have vitamin B12 and folic acid. Vitamin B12, you know to say that for you to absorb vitamin B12, you need the intrinsic factor. So the intrinsic factor is mainly produced by the parietal cells in the stomach. So in the stomach, you have gastric pits. Those gastric pits will contain a lot of cells. You have the chief cells, parietal cells. You have histamine producing cells in other cells. So they are producing hydrochloric acid and they are producing other enzymes like pepsinogen that will be transformed into pepsin. But the cells that are producing intrinsic factor that is necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12 are called parietal cells. So the parietal cells are the ones that are producing intrinsic factor and they also produce hydrochloric acid. So for a normal human being to absorb vitamin B12, you need intrinsic factor. And this vitamin B12 is necessary for the maturation of red blood cell. Mainly it's involved in the development of the DNA. So if you want a, a cell to have more of the DNA, you need the vitamin B12. So for the cell to undergo those developments, you need the DNA. So this DNA maturation of the cells uh, is mainly facilitated by vitamin B12 and also folic acid. So even folic acid is involved. That's why um, pregnant women, they are encouraged to drink a lot of folic acid. Why? It's because that is going to encourage the production of blood cells. You know, to say if you are culling uh, an embryo or you are pregnant, you have a fetus, that would also require more oxygen. So you need more blood to carry oxygen to the fetus as well. So in mothers, uh, 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 pregnant women, they are encouraged to, to take a lot of folic acid because that is going to facilitate maturation of red blood cells. Then you also have factors that are necessary for hemoglobin production. So these factors that are necessary for hemoglobin production uh, vitamin C. Vitamin C, you know that it helps in iron absorption. So for a person to be able to absorb iron, and iron is part of the hemoglobin, so it's part of the heme group of the hemoglobin, so you need vitamin C so that you are able to absorb iron. And this iron can be transformed from um, the ferric state into the ferrous state. So the, the form of iron that can combine with oxygen within the heme is supposed to be in the ferric state. So the ferrous state whereby iron has lost about three electrons, it means that it can't combine with oxygen. So it has to be uh, converted into the, the ferrous state. So the, uh, the ferric state is not good for combining with oxygen, but uh, the ferric state is the one that will combine. I mean, uh, the ferric state is not good with combining with oxygen, but the ferrous state, of iron is the one that is good with combining oxygen. Okay, you also have proteins, of course, because you have synthesis of globulin, so you need amino acids for the synthesis of globulin. Then you also need iron and copper and other minerals like calcium, uh, bio salts, cobalt, and nickel. So these are important when it comes to the production of the heme. So the synthesis of the heme, you need iron and other uh, minerals which are listed down there. 
So these are the factors that are involved in the duration of erythropoiesis because you need the growth factors, you need maturation factors, then you also need factors that are necessary for the production of hemoglobin. Okay, so now looking at erythropoietin as a hormone. So this erythropoietin is a glycoprotein and it has got a molecular weight of 34,000. Then it has a sequence of amino acids. These are 165 amino acid residues that will form erythropoietin. So in short, you have 165 amino acids that will combine to form erythropoietin. On top of that, you have a carbohydrate attaching to the protein. That's why it's called a glycoprotein. Remember, a glycoprotein is a combination of a carbohydrate and a protein. So this erythropoietin is a combination of a carbohydrate and a protein in a structure. So you find that this erythropoietin is able to go and bind to erythropoietin receptors that are found to different cells at different stages of erythropoiesis. So the formation of erythropoietin, I've already told you to say that 85% is being formed in the endothelial cells of peritubular capillaries in the renal tubules. So in the renal tubules or the kidney nephron, you have endothelial cells within the peritubular capillaries that are capable of producing uh, erythropoietin. So 85% is coming from the kidneys, then the 15% is formed within the liver. So you have the hepatic cells or hepatocytes and the CUFA cells that are also responsible for the production of erythropoietin. So in case of hypoxia, it means that these cells now will be stimulated to produce more of erythropoietin. Then the breakdown of erythropoietin is done within the liver. So metabolism of erythropoietin is done within the liver and the half-life of erythropoietin is five hours. So it means that erythropoietin can survive uh, within circulation for about five hours. So you need continuous production of it so that you maintain the levels of red blood cells in circulation. So you can see here the juxtaglomerular uh, nephron. So this juxta medullary nephron, you have the juxtaglomerular apparatus, but the cells that are responsible for the production of um, uh, the erythropoietin are called peritubular capillaries. Capillaries. So you have these peritubular capillaries, you have the endothelial cells within the peritubular capillaries that are responsible for the production of erythropoietin. Okay, so depending on the factors in nomoxia, nomoxia it means you have no more levels of oxygen circulation. You have just few cells that are responsible for production of uh, erythropoietin, just normal cells that are producing erythropoietin. But in hypoxia, so hypoxia is a factor, it will stimulate these cells to produce more of erythropoietin so that you have more production of red blood cell later on. Okay, so it's the same process here. You have the kidneys, peritubular capillaries. When there's a, a hypoxia, hypoxia is going to induce the kidney to produce erythropoietin. So you can see now the peritubular capillaries, they are going to produce a lot of erythropoietin. You have pericytes. The pericytes are the ones that are responsible for production of erythropoietin. Then once erythropoietin has been produced, it will move via um, blood. So blood is going to transport the same erythropoietin. So it will go to those cells within the bone marrow. This is where you have erythropoiesis taking place. So you can see at which stage the erythropoietin is going to stimulate these cells. So you have colon forming unit erythrocyte that has got a receptor for erythropoietin. Then you also have pro erythroblast that also has got a receptor and the basophilic erythroblast. So these three cells are able to respond to erythropoietin. So the erythropoietin is going to stimulate them to undergo differentiation. So they're going to develop into these other cells and then later on, they will become the reticulocytes, and then they will form erythrocytes, like we have already discussed. So this is the stage at which the erythropoietin is going to stimulate these cells. Remember the hematopoietic stem cell and also these other um, erythroid progenitor cells, they don't have receptors for uh, erythropoietin. So they are, going, they are not going to respond to erythropoietin, but these other three cells, they will because they can express those receptors for erythropoietin. 
Then the duration of erythropoietin circulation, so you know to say you have oxygen sensors within those cells, the, peri, uh, the pericytes, they have oxygen sensors, so they are able to sense oxygen. So in absence of oxygen, they're going to be stimulated to produce a lot of uh, uh, erythropoietin. So they could be in deox state or ox state. So if these sensors, oxygen sensors, they are in ox state, then it means they don't produce a lot of uh, erythropoietin. But if they are in deox state, so once they are in deox state, then they'll produce a lot of oxygen. And then, um, then you also have these factors like the hypoxia inducible factor. So this, the hypoxia inducible factor is the one that is going also to stimulate these cells to produce a lot of um, erythropoietin. So the uh, hypoxia inducible factor is going to stimulate those cells for the production of a particular gene. This gene is called erythropoietin gene. So you have a DNA that is developing because of these factors, they have stimulated those cells. Then you have a DNA that is developing. And this DNA will be, um, okay, so after the formation of the DNA, then you have transcription of the DNA into the erythropoietin messenger RNA then the erythropoietin messenger RNA will now undergo translation for the production of the actual hormone, which is called the erythropoietin by the ribosomes. Then this uh, erythropoietin will go in circulation to go and stimulate those three cells that we've discussed because they can have the receptor for erythropoietin. Then the stimuli for the production of erythropoietin, like I said, you have hypoxia. So these are just some, some of the stimuli that can stimulate the production of erythropoietin. So hypoxia, we've already discussed, then also products of red blood cell destruction. So as cells are undergoing uh, hemolysis or they are being uh, destroyed, you find that there are components of red blood cell that can also stimulate more production of um, erythropoietin so that they are replaced by new cells later on. And then high altitude, you know, to say the higher you go, there is less oxygen and that will, predispose you to hypoxia, and then you start producing a lot of erythropoietin. Anemia, you have uh, less blood to transport oxygen, and that can also be linked to hypoxia or hypoxemia, and then that will also result into more production of erythropoietin. Then you also have certain conditions like chronic lung or heart diseases that can also stimulate more production of erythropoietin. You have catecholamines as... Um, uh, uh, hormones, so these catecholamines, you're talking of epinephrine or epinephrine, that can also stimulate the production of red blood cells and also prostaglandins. So prostaglandins, for instance, in females, when they're having menses, they will produce a lot of these prostaglandins. So when females, they're having menses, they're losing blood. So you also need to replace that blood. So you find that when they're having menses, they also produce a lot of prostaglandins, and these prostaglandins will go and stimulate, stimulate the production of uh, erythropoietin, and the erythropoietin in turn will stimulate the more production of red blood cells. And then you also have other hormones uh, like androgens that can also stimulate the production of red blood cells. So the factors that are going to inhibit the production of erythropoietin mean is blood transfusion. So when you're having blood transfusion, that is going to inhibit the more production of erythropoietin. Why? It's because you're going to have more red blood cell in circulation after transfusion. So that can inhibit, to some extent, the production of uh, erythropoietin. The functions of erythropoietin, I think I've already discussed this with you guys, men is going to stimulate more production of red blood cells. So it's coming from the liver here and the kidneys and then it will be transported by the bloodstream to go to the red bone marrow to stimulate the production of uh, red blood cells. So there will be an increase in the number of red blood cells after erythropoietin. So that's a major function of erythropoietin. So there are three sub-functions of uh, erythropoietin as listed here. The first one is going to promote uh, pro normal blast production. Then later on, it will shorten the transition time through the normal blast stage then later on, it's going to promote the early release of reticulocytes so that you have more of these uh, blood cells uh, being developed from the red bone marrow.
then the growth inducers and differentiation inducers, these we've already discussed. So you have interleukins and then you have colon stimulating factors that we've already discussed. Then maturation factors, I think we've also discussed vitamin B12 and folic acid, why you need it. And the source of vitamin uh, B12 mainly is from animal tissue. So animal tissue have a lot of vitamin B12. So you know to say it's going to help in absorption of uh, uh, the intrinsic factor is it's the one that is going to help the absorption of vitamin B B12, but the absorption of vitamin B12 is taking place within the ileum. So you have the small intestines, the, the last part of the small intestines, which is called the, the ileum, is the one that is involved in absorption of vitamin B12. Okay. So these are animal tissue that are rich in uh, vitamin B12. So for you to have lot of red blood cells, you need to eat a lot of animal tissue. So you can see there's meat here, chicken, sausages, fish, just to mention a few. So all these uh, will give you vitamin B12. Folic acid, many vegetables, yeast, and liver. That's where you're going to find a lot of folic acid. So if you are a pregnant woman, make sure that you're eating your vegetables, you're eating uh, maybe scones that you use yeast, and also you're eating liver. So you buy liver from the butcher, you prepare it. It's a very good source of folic acid and the function is involved in maturation of red blood cell. Okay, so it's basically the same information here and other factors that are involved. These are just additional factors that are involved in the curating of uh, poiesis. You have nutritional factors like food, like proteins, because you need uh, the production of global, um, uh, hemoglobin, so hemoglobin mainly is formed from amino acids, so you need your proteins, then you need your minerals, the iron, copper, zinc, cobalt, that is involved in hemoglobin synthesis, and then you have vitamins, B12, folic acid, uh, riboflavin, and then you have peridoxine, and then vitamin C, all this will help in the development of red blood cells. Then you also have hormones that can come in to help in development of red blood cells. You have testosterone, thyroxine, adrenal hormones, pituitary hormones, like that can also stimulate uh, erythropoietin production. So these will stimulate the production of erythropoietin. So we have uh, pituitary hormones, some of them, they can stimulate the production of erythropoietin by the kidneys. Then you also have neurostimulation. So neurostimulation, for instance, if you have stimulation of the hypothalamus, that is also going to increase the production of red blood cells. So these are some of the factors that are involved in erythropoiesis. So in general, that's what we had. So at the end here, you just have uh, a short video that is going to summarize everything. So at your own time, you can watch that. Yeah? So I'll put this uh, in your PowerPoint so that you're able to appreciate. Otherwise, that's it for today. So next time we meet to discuss uh, leukopoiesis and thrombopoiesis. Then after that, we'll go into other components of blood physiology. So for now, we'll end here. I don't think we'll have much time for me to start looking at leukopoiesis and thrombopoiesis. I can see most of you are already tired. So uh, for today, we're going to end here. Unless if there are questions. If there are questions, Yes, Chanda, you can ask. <laughs> can you kind of speak up? <laughs> Okay, guys, should I take it that you don't have questions so that I end my class? So we don't have questions. Don't speak for others. So if you don't have a question, you just keep quiet. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
all right so uh, i'm going to end this class now so if you want to revise you can watch the video i'm going to post a video to moodle then you'll be able to uh, check for more information okay thank you very much enjoy the rest of your day yeah, welcome.